Welcome to Honest Money, your best guide to financial freedom. I'm Warren Ingram, the author of a few best-selling books, and I'm also an award-winning financial planner, and I've helped thousands of people on their journey to financial freedom. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I am here to share my experience and the best ideas that I've learned, and I hope these ideas help you on your journey to financial freedom. Honest Money is proudly sponsored by Outsurance. If you have a family, you'll want to be sure that you can take care of them financially if you're not around. SMS LIFE to 30165 and Outsurance will call you back to discuss your life insurance needs and give you a quote to match. Outsurance, you always get something out. Outsurance LIFE is a licensed insurer and FSP. T's and C's apply. 50 cents per SMS. Welcome to Honest Money. Today is a really interesting recording because uh, we're going to talk about a, a, a topic that that's quite controversial sometimes, and, and it's about life insurance. And it's one of those things that that we get told all the time that we need. You know, when I've studied this uh, in my courses as a financial planner, I've studied that that I do need it. But but it's always a difficult one because we're talking about dying. I mean, that's that's really when it's going to come about, and and so none of us like to think about death, uh, or we're talking about disability. And it's all all really tough stuff to think about, and and as human beings, I guess we're programmed to, uh, to to think about the positive and not the negative, so we shy away from the stuff. That doesn't mean that it's not important. I think it is very important, uh, but but it's a, it's about making sure that we have good life insurance at the right time for the right reasons. So so I thought you know if we're going to do this, we need to to speak to somebody who knows a lot more than me about this. So I'm really thrilled to have Paul Mieza, who's the chief operating officer of Outsurance Life. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Warren. Just uh, touching on one of the points in your in your intro, um, you you were asking about you know everybody knows that they need life insurance or they believe they need life insurance or they're told they need life insurance, but they're not actually really certain as to whether they need it or not. And I just want to give you just leave you with one little point, um, you know, short term insurance, which is vehicle insurance, home insurance, etc. There you insure yourself for a potential event that may or may not happen at some time in the future. Life insurance, you insure yourself for an event that will happen. And I know it's sad news for people to hear that, but we will die. So What? It's, yeah, it's, going, it's going to happen. Now you tell me. <laughs> um, so so just, just, just as a starting point there, you know, just to get people, you know, if you're prepared to insure for something that might happen, uh, are you not willing to insure for something that is actually going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, fair, fair, I think it's a fair point, and and, and I think so, so. So let's let's start at at step one. What what are we talking about when we talk about life insurance? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and and the one the one interesting thing is that it's actually not even life insurance; it's life assurance. Um, we don't use the proper technical term of assurance because um, everybody just understands the colloquial term insurance, but there is a, 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 a fundamental distinction. So insurance is um, short term insurance, um, which covers assets. Um, motor vehicles, houses, people are all familiar with that, right? So you insure yourself against that loss. Um, life assurance um, is actually long-term insurance, which is there to provide for your dependents, your loved ones, um, to protect their lifestyle um, and to, to, to service debts um, and also that other issues that might, or not might, but will arise after your demise, okay? Now, why the distinction between assurance and insurance? And don't worry about that because it's a technical term, but I, I like to just highlight it because it gives the, the distinction. Insurance is something that you can replace. I can insure a phone, I can insure a vehicle, because when your vehicle is damaged, lost, stolen, I ask you what model it was, you say it was a BMW 320, I get you a BMW 320 and give it back to you. I cannot insure Warren because when Warren's gone, I cannot give Warren back their family, I cannot give your family rather, Warren back. What I can do is give them assurance that I can actually compensate for their loss in terms of his income, the lifestyle that he created, et cetera. And, and that is the fundamental distinction. So in, in one instance, we're trying to replace something. In another instance, we're trying to compensate for a loss. Okay. All right. Thank you. So so if we're if I'm thinking it through, uh, th- th- there might be times where where s- certain people won't need life assurance. I'm gonna I'm gonna use your. I always thought it was uh, it was just an in- um, interesting sales pitch by the industry. But I take your point. The difference between insurance and assurance. So so uh, th- th- there are I guess going to be circumstances where people don't need life assurance. 
and maybe let's start there because uh, it's it's probably pointless to say everybody need it, needs it because uh, they, they won't believe us if they're listening to us today. But but potentially, uh, who doesn't need it? Let's let's go. So, there. Okay, l- l- let's let's start there. Um, you know, if you are in the absolute elite wealthy of in, in South Africa's population in that top two percent. Uh, you know, if um, the couple of chaps down here in the Stellenbosch region will probably fit into that, um, into that bracket. But so if you if you're in if you're in that bracket, well, I, I, you, you can argue that you don't need life assurance. Um, alternatively, the one big mistake that people often make is young people tell you, "I don't need life assurance. I don't have any dependents, um, etc." The problem with that sort of thinking is that. Sure, at the age of 22 or 23, I don't need life assurance. I don't have any dependents. If I pass on, I haven't uh, got any significant debt, et cetera, et cetera. Guess what happens? You know, human beings um, evolve every seven years of their lives. You know, and, and, and we have life events. We have life events that change fundamentally. But I like the seven year cycle because it helps people understand. You know, if you take uh, as, a, as a youngster, if you can hardly tell the difference between a, a four-year-old and a six-year-old. Pretty much the same person. But a seven-year-old is very different. And once you pass the age of seven, anything, eight, nine, ten, eleven, all those people. But once you, a 14-year-old is quite different. And if you keep adding those seven-year cycles, you know, a 21-year-old and a 28-year-old are fundamentally different. 21-year-old and a 24-year-old are, are both equally irresponsible. But, you know, <laughs> once they hit 28, something fundamentally shifts. 28 to 35. So... That's my little seven-year cycle pitch. Now, if you take that as a mindset, and then you just understand, so that's how your life shifts. So even if you're young and you think, I don't need life assurance, um, guess what? There will come a time when circumstances and life events will change and your needs will change. And But as you get older, life insurance gets more and more expensive. Um, so the smart thing to do is to get this thing as early as possible um, at, at, the, at the cheapest possible rate. Um, because a couple of things happen is, Every single, every single, every single year, you get older. You know, people forget that, and I always, I, I try and remind our trainees that um, a a surefire sign that you're getting older is every year when people sing that song, "Happy Birthday." Um, just it, it means something. It's it's not just the party. You're actually getting older, and we we can't guarantee our health status. We don't know how our health. You know, fundamentally, our health obviously does get worse with age. Um, you know, if we're fortunate, we stay in good health. But those are the things to bear in mind. So, you know, saying who doesn't need it, it's a very, very difficult question to answer because if you look at the life assurance gap in South Africa, for argument's sakes, it's estimated that it's close to a trillion rands in terms of the gap. Now, what is a life assurance gap? That means the cover that people actually need versus the cover that they actually have. And, you know, I, and, I can, and I can tell you now that um, it's highly unlikely for any individual to ever be able to buy the actual amount of life insurance that they actually need. Because just from a cost point of view, and let me give you a simplistic example. So we have a very common sum assured in South Africa is 1 million rands. Okay? Uh, you go and look among sum assured, lots of people have got a million rands covered. It just sounds good. You know? uh, a million rands. It's, but, but now you break it down. You take a, 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 um, a, fam- a young family of four, uh, and, and let's make it even modest. And uh, let's say that they have monthly expenses of around about 30,000 rands for this family of four. So they take out a million rands life cover. Before three and a half years is up, that family is destitute. Because that's all they had. Yeah, that, that's it. So uh, that million rands actually is quite insignificant in terms of their cover. So l- let me touch on the important... So what are the important things to determine whether you need life cover or not? There are two things. Uh, one is called the replacement ratio, and I'll break that down so it's not... Replacement ratio and time horizon. And replacement, replacement ratio simply means what am I trying to replace? In this case, it's income. Right? How much money do I need to replace it? And the time horizon is how long do I need to replace this money for? The, the idea of not needing cover comes from a belief that you have lots of money. That's why the million rand sounds great, because it sounds like a big number. It's not. It's a, it's a, it's a minuscule number. Right? Um, it's for the same reason that people think, for argument's sakes, global sports stars um, earn a fortune. Yes, they do. They earn big numbers, for, but for a very short career. And then, they, and then they have to replace that income over long periods of time. You know, I take, you take a, a young Premier League English footballer who, um, and, I, and, I, and I think back in the late 90s, this guy comes to the fore, and he comes to the fore as sort of 20-year-old. 
He has an eight-year sort of career. Obviously, he makes an absolute fortune playing the, the top-flight English Premier League football. Eight years later, um, it's all over. No income. Now, we all know the, the moment you have expenses and no income, it's downhill from there. And at the time that this guy stopped playing, um, I mean, w- what are we talking now? We're talking 16, 17 years. 17 years later, I'm still fortunate enough to be working and earning an income. For 17 years, he hasn't had any income coming in. So no matter how mind-boggling the amount of money that he used to earn at EPL, it's now insignificant. So let's just take that back to insurance. So let's say that, that 16 years ago, I'd got a life insurance payout of 5 million rands. 16 years later, this, is, this comes back to my point that very few of us will ever actually be able to buy and afford the cover that we actually need, but we, we need to try and close that gap as much as possible. Right? So how do you determine what cover you need? It's very simplistically, for the, for the average guy on the street, just sit down and say, what does my family live on every month? How much, how much are my kids' school fees? Right? And then fundamentally, if I, if I pass on, do I still want my kids to go to school? Hopefully the answer is yes. You know, if you obviously don't want your kids to go to school, then so back to your issue of who doesn't need life cover. Well, if you hate your family, that's also fine. <laughs> <laughs> but but if, if you want your kids to go to school, so simple. How much do I pay now for their education? Add some inflation. How long will they need to go to school? How old are they? So that's kind of a time horizon issue. If they're toddlers, that means they've got to go through school. Do you want them to go to university? Where do you want them to go to university? You start figuring that out. And you start realizing that that's just education alone. Okay? Would you like your wife to still have a car after you've gone? Or do you need her to walk? It's up to you. But, you know, uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you'd like her to have a car. Would you like them to still have a home? And once you've answered all these questions, you start understanding... Um, get a, a picture. Now, obviously, you'll never be able to afford all that life cover at once, and that's why we review these things on an ongoing basis, right? Yeah, and that's my concern, is that you're creating a huge number uh, if try if you try and ensure all of that yeah, as early as possible. And, and you, you can't do it all at once. You can't do it all at once, and, 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 and that's why the life stage events are important, because you then are able to match the cover that you buy to your circumstances at the time, you know? Um, and if you get proper advice you're able to use different products to, to, to match the needs. So it, 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 a case in point may be that I need to cover a bond, right? I need to cover a bond. But if I have a term of 10 years left on the bond, um, then perhaps I can take term cover, right? Which is significantly cheaper. Um, but what I'm... So, 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 so let's break that down. When you say term cover, what, what, what does that mean? As opposed to where I buy a, a whole life policy. So in other words... Uh, maybe I'm in my 20s and I buy a, a, a life insurance policy, which will continue for the rest of my natural life um, okay. and will pay out on death. Right? In this instance, I realize that, look, I need, I've got a bond of $2 million. Um, I need to cover that bond because, God forbid, if something happens to me, I want my family to still stay in the home. But I've only got a 10-year term left on the bond. So I can take out term cover, which then expires after 10 years. Right? Um, because when the 10 years is up, I don't need to pay off the house. The house is now paid off, so I don't need the two million rands anymore. And I'm not dead, which I'm happy. So, uh, you know, <laughs> so, so, so everybody's fine. But I, that, again, there's a, it's understanding. If I, if I understand that and I understand the need, then I can match it. So it means I can, I can buy that reasonably cheaper cover, but to cover a specific purpose. To cover that specific purpose for a specific time. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're dropping hundreds and hundreds of wonderful gems of, of information here that, I, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut in. So, so is it right that if I were to insure, let's just use the example of a 2 million rand uh, amount because that's my bond uh, and I know my bond's got 10 years to go. Uh, and I say, okay, I only want to insure 2 million and I only want to insure it for 10 years. Is that cheaper than saying, give me 2 million cover on my life for the rest of my life? Significantly cheaper significantly cheaper okay so and, and, and that's right. and that's why as i say in terms of if, if you do a needs analysis and if you match your cover needs right so let's take two two individuals here um uh, both individuals uh look at look at all their expenses etc lifestyle their homes and they realize they need six million rands worth of cover um individual a um is very fortunate and life has shined on him and is, he's got lots of money so he can pay the premium for six million rands. Individual B has got a tighter budget. He says, I know I need six million worth of cover, but I, I can't afford the premium right now. Um, right? Yeah. So, so, so how do I break this? Which is most of us. 
yeah. yeah, yeah, that's most of us. Yeah, other than you know, but I've got a few colleagues like Chris who set up this interview that doesn't fall in that bracket. But I mean, the rest of us, <laughs> the rest <laughs> the of us struggle. The rest of us earners, yeah, yeah. Person B um, can then sit back and say, okay, l- let me break this down. Of the six million life cover that I need, two million of it is actually for my bond, and that need will expire in ten years. So how about I take four million cover? So at least I reduce that that premium and take the two million as term cover. All right. Okay. So so let's let's stay on that for a second. So the four million you're talking about is to use the the phrasing you, you, that would be your whole life cover. So that's covering for the rest of your 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 natural life. Um, and the two million is then for a specific need for a specific period of time. And in the insurance industry, that's term cover. Yes. And and, and when when you make these decisions, you know. The one thing that people don't understand is that insurance uh, or life insurance is not for enrichment. That's actually the, one of the first laws of, of, of life insurance. It is not for enrichment, right? Um, uh, that's why there must always be an insurable interest. Okay. So so let, let's just talk that through. So in other words, I can't insure myself so that my family is going to be in a better financial position that, uh, if I'm dead than, than when I was alive. That's the, the, yes. the, the starting and, point of something like that. And, and the fundamental rule of that is that it, there's a moral hazard right there. Right, um, because I mean, can, can you imagine if we live in a household where you know uh, dad earns um, five thousand rands a month, so um, but he takes out ten million rands worth of life cover. In tough times, people could be walking around and saying, you know, if dad is still here at the end of the year, we'll have sixty thousand rands. On the other hand, <laughs> if <laughs> <laughs> I see where you're going with this. <laughs> It's a bit scary being dad now. Exactly. There's a, there's a, there's a moral hazard. So, 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 you know, there's a starting point that life insurance is not for enrichment. Now, if you understand that principle, and you come back to my two individuals who are taking out... Now, what, what does happen is, um, look, often um, there's an unintended consequence that it does give enrichment, right? Because I, I take out a, 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 a... You know, if I take my myself as a case in point, obviously... You know, my, 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 my children, I mean, my daughter just turned 21 yesterday, actually. So... Congrats. Thank you. Now, um, obviously, from the time she was a baby, I've taken out significant life cover, etc., etc. Fortunately, I haven't died, right? Um, which is a good thing. And, yeah. But, but it, it does mean that that actual need that I was covering has been reducing all the time, right? Um, you know, she's now she's now 21. I've I've finished paying for her schooling. Um, almost finished paying for her university. Um, so you know, it's reducing all the time. So yeah. So 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 the unintended consequences that at some stage um, when I do pass away, then they will just get a lump sum of money and the debts will all be gone. Then then they will get enriched. But that wasn't the intention. So on day one, when you when you took out the insurance, you weren't that wasn't the purpose. So it could be almost a lucky accident for the family, not for you, I guess. But, exactly. But uh, and, and that's okay. So so there, there wouldn't be a problem then with the insurance company saying no, 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 we're not paying out. No, not at all. Not at all. No, not at all. Not at all. So then, then you see, at the, at the time of taking the cover, there needs to be an insurable interest, right? Okay. And insurable interest means what are you trying to replace? Is it commensurate? Um, I cannot apply for 10 million rands of, of cover if I earn 60,000 rands a year. It, this, this, the risk is, is just not commensurate, right? So, but the, the reason that I was going along these lines is I was coming down to the, how you select what you actually need to cover. So if you understand that this thing is not for enrichment, and back to my, my, my 6 million example, and you just want to cover that 2 million bond, well, then take term cover. Because, Great. Uh, because when, when, when that need has fallen away, you've covered the thing and the, the, the need has fallen away, you know? So very, very, very much in, in line with short-term insurance. I mean, you insure your car on a month-by-month month basis, um, for a short-term basis. Um, if you sell your car and decide to Uber, you will stop paying short-term insurance. So, so I, I like that. I think that's a that, that's a real uh, tip from the inside of the industry, not not one I've actually even uh, heard of before. Uh, it, so, so for people that are looking at this and, and 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 their own lives and saying, okay, what do I do in a situation where I don't have enough cover? If I if I try to th- uh, s- summarize, uh, step one would be. Uh, you know the most important things. So, so f- for me, as you say, if you if you've got a house that's got a bond and you want your family to have a place to stay, then then make sure that you've covered it at the very least. You've covered the the, the debt so that if you pass away, the family at least live in live in the house. They're not forced to to move, uh, and then potentially the rest of the debts of the family. So if you've got car debt, credit card debt, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, try and cover. Try and make sure you've covered that. If you've still got budget. Uh, 
then start to ensure for, for replacing the income that you are bringing into the family so that they can still eat and, and live and, and, as you say, put the kids through school and, and, and varsity and the like. So, so if we had an order of priority, would that be a fair sort of summary? That's a, it's a fair summary. And the only, the only caveat there is that just as a starting point, you know, I, and I've, I've talked about the term cover now, but, and remember, that's just a budgeting issue. It's affordability. The first prize is obviously to buy the whole life cover because, you know, uh, so using my 10, 10 years of, uh, left on the bond example, I mean, first prize is, uh, look, I've paid this premium. I continue to pay the premium and let the cover continue. Um, so because, because I, I mean, um, on term cover, you must understand that you lose the cover at the end of the end of the event, right? Um, okay, that's right? a good point. So, yeah. so, first, so first prize is rather get the whole of life cover. But if the budget is constrained, and you, as you said, at, at the very least, I just want to make sure that my my family still has a home, you know, after I've passed. Um, then we have, and then we have other issues as well, like accelerated cover. Okay, so accelerated benefits are a very important component. Um, of, 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 your, of your life insurance packaging. That's why it is so important to talk to a professional and do a proper needs analysis. You know, don't just sit there and thumbs up and say, I'm buying a million rand's cover. To actually understand, what am I buying? What am I covering? So what, what do we mean by accelerated benefits? This is, these are amounts of cover that are paid um, from the original summer, sh- uh, summer short. Right? So as a case in point, I could, for instance, um, you know, first prize, maybe let's say I need five million rand life cover. Um, I then buy um, another three million rand lump sum disability cover, right? And why is that important? Because you've got to package these things. I mean, can you can you imagine what's the point of me having a huge life cover policy and no disability in, uh, or no lump sum disability policy, no disability income policy? God forbid something happens to me um, in my early thirties and I'm disabled and I'm now destitute, and then and people are like. And, but I thought you were, you were fully covered. He says, no, no, no. I promise you, I'll be, there'll be lots of money coming in one day when I die. But and, and the issue is you're not dead yet. So you, you've got... You have to pay the policy premium. Yeah. So you've got to package these things. So now, so ideally, if I should say I've got 5 million cover and I buy another 3 million dis- lump sum disability. Um, if I cannot afford to buy all the cover that I need, I can package my cover as accelerated benefits, right? Um, and an accelerated benefit pays out, so if you take something like critical illnesses, for argument's sake, your, some, a portion of your critical illness cover can be an accelerated benefit of your death cover. So I have five million death cover, but I have one million accelerated critical illness. So if I, if I, if I suffer from a specific critical illness, which has impeded my lifestyle, I could now get the one million rand paid out. It obviously gets deducted from the original five million because it's an accelerated benefit. Are you with me? Okay. So, so my five million life cover will, will then become four million life cover, yes. but I've got a million rand that I've, that's paid out because I had this critical illness. I've got a million rand that's paid out because I have this critical illness. I've got medical expenses right now. Um, it, it doesn't help me to be sitting with a, a five million rand policy when I've got medical expenses today that I need to cover. So the accelerated benefit comes into play then and becomes useful. Um, again, if I don't have budget constraints, I don't need to accelerate the benefit. But if I want to work within a budget, I can use the accelerated portion. Um, so if I don't get the critical illness, that's great. My five million still stays intact. Right. So so let's just talk that through, Paul. So, so are we, is that cheaper? Where if I take my life cover, my disability cover, my critical illness, and I package it together in one policy, that, is that a way I can save money as opposed to you, each of those standalone? Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a, yeah. First of all, first of all um, the, the first reason you save money, before we even get to the accelerated part, the first reason you save money is because um, you're pooling the risks, right? Insurance is all about pooling risks, right? So, and, and for, 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 the, for, 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 for the layperson on the street, um, a South African term that people will understand called the stock fail. Insurance is a big stock yeah. fail, right? Insurance is a big stock fail. It's about pooling risks. You take the premiums of many, contributions of many, pull them together so that each underlying member can benefit as and when the insured event manifests, right? So, by combining those covers, you're already pooling. You're already pooling the risks, right? So in the same vein, in the same vein, and if I can just jump to short-term insurance for because it's easier to explain, and then I'll come back to life. In the same vein that if you go and insure your vehicle, one vehicle with an insurer, you pay a significant premium for that one vehicle. When you insure three vehicles plus your home plus all other assets, you'll see your premium drop significantly. 
And the reason your premiums drop significantly is because the probability of you crashing your car at 8, 8, 8 a.m. this morning while your wife crashes it uh, somewhere else, crashes your other car somewhere else at 10 past 8, and your daughter crashes the car at quarter past 8 somewhere else, is very slim, right? Because you, you suddenly you've, you've spread the risk, right? You've spread the risk. Whenever, whenever you insure one uh, uh, asset, it, the risk is concentrated. So likewise, if I apply for just pure life cover, the insurer is just insuring my life, so they assess my age, um, uh, health factors, etc., and determine my premium, okay? And that's all they're covering, so that's, that's the risk factor, if Paul dies. Paul now suddenly adds lump sum disability. Now there are two aggregated risk factors, you know? Paul, we, we might pay if Paul dies, but we might pay if he gets, lump, if, if he gets disabled. The probability of both of them happening you know, within a short space of time is, is slim. Paul now adds critical illness. So the, the more things I add, the, the more I spread the risk. So the premium gets aggregated. But then, as I said, if you then accelerate the benefit, in other words, now you're packaging it um, under one cover umbrella. And, and, and the thought process there is, okay, so I've taken 10 million rands worth of cover. Um, I really, really don't want to cover critical illness, but I can't afford to add another five, or another two million of critical illness, let me package it within the 10 million. So that if I have a critical illness, deduct the uh, two million from my 10 million cover, because I, my need will suddenly change. I'll suddenly have a desperate need for that two million because of my medical expenses, because of my situation then. If I don't have a critical illness, that need won't arise, and that's fine, then I keep my 10 million. So that's a, that's a great money saver again. So now we've got two. We've got the accelerated, if we, if we need it, package, uh, package your insurances together. And, and don't forget about term cover if, if, you, can't, uh, if, if you can't afford the whole, the, the whole of life. The, the, the one thing that, that always bothers me with insurance is, you know, I go and I, I, let's say we use your 10 million rand example. So, so I speak to someone, they say, right, you need 10 million rand. So I say, okay, great. Then they tell me I have to go off to, uh, to, to go and get tests. And that bothers me because it's, a, it's an issue, it's a hassle. Why am I doing this? What, what's the point of these medical tests that I've got to go through? What are they, what are they trying to find out from me? <laughs> okay, so um, it's, it, remember I said that uh, insurance is about pooling risks, right? Yeah. So we have pooled a whole lot of risks together. Um, you pool a whole lot of risks together for the benefit. So you take the premiums from everybody for, for everybody's benefit. So we're all, we all belong to a club. The moment you join this thing, and that's why I use the stock fell as an example, um, we are now all belong to the club and we're all contributing to the club. Right? In order for all of us and for this thing um, uh, to be sustainable, right? in order for this thing to be sustainable, it means that we must have enough reserves in the pool and we must match the risk um, to the benefit and to the contributions. Right? So now bear in mind that as we all join in the club, we all join at different ages, right? So the younger younger people have cheaper premiums because their risk because of because of because of uh, the significantly reduced risk, right? Um, older people obviously have a greater risk of mortality and therefore they have a higher premium. Now, if you don't underwrite, because what you're talking about, um, the, the risk selection is called underwriting. So underwriting starts with please tell me how old you are, please tell me who you yeah. are, please tell me where you live, okay? Um, uh, you know, please tell me your habits. Um, uh, yeah. uh, if I smoke or if I don't smoke. Smoke, don't smoke. Um, if you belong to a violent gang. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these, are, these, are, these are all factors that uh, need to come into play. Because if I say to everybody, come into the pool, you all play, pay a flat 20 rands um, uh, premium into the pool. And don't worry, if anybody, if, if, if anybody dies, we'll pay out uh, 2 million rands to everybody. Uh, that 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 pool will be decimated in no time, um, because if I, because if I do smoke and I belong to a violent gang and do all these, uh, I'm going to claim uh, up front. So, what you're discuss, uh, describing as underwriting is purely risk selection. The medical tests and any questions that underwriters ask are not there to penalise anybody. They're not there to penalise anybody. They're actually there to protect the pool. It's there to protect the pool. To, uh, and to ensure that everybody is paying a premium that's commensurate with their risk. If I'm if I'm if I'm relatively young, uh, you know, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I exercise a lot, I eat well, d d and I go for these tests. Does that mean I'm going to potentially pay a bit less than someone who drinks a lot, smokes too much, doesn't exercise? Absolutely. So there's a benefit to me if I'm healthy. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. So, as a, so as a starting point, and, and that's one of the things I said in our, earlier in our conversation, that um, the best way to save on life insurance is to buy it as early as possible. My life insurance today is cheaper than it will be tomorrow. <laughs> I'm a day older tomorrow. You know, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. So the, the sooner you buy the thing, the better. I mean, if you, if you take what, what we call the mortality curve, right? So the mortality curve between the age of, uh, from birth to the, to the first birthday, you have a spike in the mortality curve. In other words, you have increased deaths and so it's what, what, infant mortality, right? Um, because okay. young babies are very vulnerable and unfortunately then they, they, they pass on. And what you'll see is the more developed the country, the less that is, the, more, the, the less developed the country, the higher that is. But the point is you have mortality risk from, the age, from birth to, 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 to the age of one, which, which is why the first birthday is very significant. When the child hits the first birthday, from the first birthday to the 18th birthday, the chances of that child making it to the 18th birthday increase exponentially after, you know, all things being equal, nothing's going to happen to that child, okay? Other than a, a random event, accident, whatever, but if they pass their first birthday, they're getting to 18, generally, right? Anomaly comes in the mortality curve between 18 and around about, it used to be 18 and 23, but now it's moving up to like 18 and 25. So where we suddenly see an increase in mortality, and we refer to that in life insurance as the accident hump, Okay. It's called the accident hump. People shouldn't be dying, but they are because at the age of 18, they get a driver's license. They, they find out that alcohol is drinking. They start drinking. Uh, every day is New Year's Eve. And so, <laughs> yeah, so, from, so we have that accident hump. Once they hit what used to be 23 and now we're shifting it to 25, then again, the mortality curve flattens. From there to 60, it should be smooth sailing. Okay. Then after 60, the mortality curve climbs again. So there, therein you, uh, lies your, your, your rating, right? Therein lies your rating, um, your risk rating. So that the sooner you get into this thing, the better. Then when I ask you about, when I ask you about family history, it's because I'm asking, because genetics, I thought genetics is a big player um, in, in, in future health. So when I'm asking you family history, I'm not trying to penalize you. I'm just trying to understand your genetic profile and, and your susceptibility, because the better the profile, the better the premium will be. Right, and the medical tests, as you say, for you, you can, you can only benefit um, from being healthier and therefore getting a better premium, and and it, and it's also to accommodate, and those tests help us to accommodate people with medical conditions, because if we didn't send people for medical tests, um, you know, we simply say um, health questionnaire, are you healthy? A person says, for argument's sake, I have diabetes. What do you then do as an underwriter? Because I need to know the severity of your diabetes. I want to help you. I want to accommodate you. I want to be able to insure you. But without sufficient information, I will not be able to insure you. So um, those medical tests help us to insure a huge amount of the population that we would otherwise not be able to insure. Because you then say, I have blood pressure, which is sure. Go for a medical test. You come back. We get the history that you've got controlled blood pressure. You're on medication. Everything's fine. And we give you standard rates. Suddenly we can insure you because we've got the information. Or you've had blood pressure for a long time and it's, it's elevated, at least we can insure you with a loading, but you can still be insured, right? And the, the loading is simply the means that you're going to pay a premium. Uh, 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 so the, the medical testing actually helps people out. If, if you're young and super healthy, good for you because you get a, a cheaper premium. If you have a medical condition, the medical testing helps us to ascertain your medical condition and give you a premium and still insure you. And only in the really, really rare situations where unfortunately you find that somebody is uninsurable but those are rare situations but it's, it is not there to penalize anybody so so for, for me the, the bottom line here is uh, don't begrudge it because if you are healthy you're gonna you're gonna make it uh, make a saving and if you if you're not that healthy uh, at least you know you will be insured if if they have the tests and and you know most of the time you'll still get covered you might have to pay a bit more but you'll get covered so uh, you, you, you've talked a lot about uh, about doing it early, but I, but I'm guessing that uh, you, you're not going to uh, take cover, let's say, at age 23 and never look at it again. It, it, like everything in life, you need to review as you go. Uh, wh when do we review our life insurance? I mean, is it is it something I can just fire and forget, or do I need to look at this daily, weekly? What's what's the story? No, no, it's an uh, excellent question. So, um, you know. It's planning, planning ahead. So uh, using the, the example, you're starting early. So at 23, you know, you, you're buying cover at 23 and you're probably buying cover at that stage, which theoretically you don't need. But you're thinking ahead because you understand that you will need, you will need cover. So it's, it's, it's very sensible to get cover as cheap as possible that I'm going to need anyway. 
at some stage. Now, obviously, if you're like most people, at 23, you're not going to be able to afford lots and lots of life cover um, because yeah. ho hopefully you're just starting out, right? But at least you've, you, you've made inroads, right? You've, you've taken that first, that, that first step, whatever that may be. Maybe it's half a million cover. Maybe it's 400,000 cover, whatever it is. But you've made that first step. Um, and you've bought that first step at a very cheap premium. Now, back to your question of th then how do I maintain this thing? So, you know, let's use a cricketing analogy. You know, you build an innings, you know? And you build an innings, you, you can't just stand there for 20 overs doing nothing in the hope that in the 21st over you're just going to hit every ball for six, right? You build your innings by getting singles here, two runs here, single there, two runs there, and you, and you build up your innings. The next thing you know, you, you've hit a century, right? So, likewise, the 23-year-old buys some cover at that stage. The 23-year-old then um, buys his first flat or, or whatever it is, and he suddenly realizes, oh, my needs have grown. And he buys additional cover. He gets married and he suddenly realizes, I've actually got more, more responsibility than just myself. And then he adds his cover. So life stage events. Every time you have a baby, every time you get married, every time you buy a new asset, every time. So these are all fundamental life stage events. Ideally, however, you should look at this thing every year. You should look at this thing every year. Ideally, you should just review it. I'm not saying you must buy a new cover every year, but just review your circumstances. Where do I stand? What are my, what are my needs? What are my responsibilities? Um, my debt situation. Um, have I got increased debt? Have I got reduced debt? So... So just so you understand your roadmap on an annual basis, that's what you should be doing. So, so that doesn't mean I have to go and have a batch of medical tests every year. We're, we're talking about looking at numbers. We're looking at a review rather than... That's right. Uh, re, re, okay, great. So I, I like that. That's very practical. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at our time and I'm conscious that we, we, uh, we, we're having a, a much more interesting conversation about life assurance than I ever thought we would. So, th so thanks, Paul. You're, 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 you're teaching me as I go here. Um, I think it's one of those things when we when we look at this uh, person, you know that that um, uh, and it's it's not a question to you, I guess it's a comment from me, but but uh, you know talking to young people, they're always they're always looking at uh, the big shiny thing, you know. So in other words, if they've got a thousand rand uh, excess in their budget, they typically want to save or invest it because that's exciting and the money can grow and the money can make money babies. Uh, and for me, it's always a hard uh, conversation because I think you're right. When when I look at life insurance, uh, it's not fun. It's not it's not a great topic to talk about. But that that doesn't mean it's not necessary. Um, and if I were to prioritize, if I'm talking to someone young, I'd be saying to them, okay, so that thousand rand, let, let's make sure at least that you've got life insurance to cover the debts that you've got. If you don't have any dependents, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, let, let, let's make sure that that money is well used first. R r I mean, saving, saving, and building for financial independence is critical. It is important. Yes. There are possibly other things that are more important. And and, and for me, that you know, the, 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 this has always been one way. Well, I think it's a trade-off. Life is always going to be about trade-offs. It's about making the best use of your limited resources, and, and all of us have limited resources, except your neighbours down there in, in Stellenbosch, Paul. Uh, and, so, uh, and, so, and so for the rest of us, it's about saying, okay, uh, cover the most important things, cover, the, uh, cover your debts, cover your dependents if you've got dependents, um, make sure that you've got some, some life assurance, then you can start to do some trade-offs. No, no, no problem. But but the important thing is, if you keep earning, you keep growing your earnings, uh, that, that potentially you might be yes, able so. to cover more and more of your life. And, and I think that's the, the, the trade-off here. Don't give up on the investments or give up on the life cover. It's about a combination of the two and, and getting the right balance at the right stage of life. That, that is exactly it. It's, it, it's, all, it's all about building blocks. Now, uh, uh, you're spot on. Obviously, you want to invest, you want to create wealth. But... You, you've got to follow a logical progression um, uh, in, 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 in doing things, right? So, you know, let's just take um, a, a, a youngster um, starting work in this country um, of modest means. You know, you start, you know, the, the smallest kind of policy that you can buy is a funeral policy for argument's sake. Now, why do people buy funeral policies? Well, you buy a funeral policy because you, when you passed, Somebody needs to bury you. Somebody needs to bury you. And depending on your culture, there needs to be a decent burial, etc., etc. Now, can you imagine? It, it, it's fundamental. If I, if I start working, and I, I need to be able to ensure that if something happens to me, I can be buried and I, cannot, and I will not be a burden to anybody else. Okay? Right? Um, and, and I, I mean, uh, with my first paycheck, the first thing I did was I bought an, a funeral policy to cover my mother's life. Because I now knew that you are now employed, 
should something happen to your mother, everybody will say, okay, son, would you bury her? And can you imagine if I say, can we wait for six paydays? Yeah, that's not going to work. If I can, 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 can the morgue just keep the body for a little while because yeah. you, you, you need to be able to do this thing now. So, and, and, and so in building blocks, so that you start with that and you take things off. So now if I've got a funeral policy for administration, I've, okay, I've taken the easiest and softest step, but at least I know if something happens to me, I will be buried. It's done. Ticked off. Right? Then, I, then, then my next issue is, okay, if I pass on, um, now if I have some dependents and people I look after, will they be looked after? Buy some life cover. Ticked off. Okay, look, man, if I get disabled in the meantime, so let me add disability and critical illness. Ticked off. Okay, great. Now I've got a bit of time to breathe because I've covered these things that are the scariest, right? So now I can start, now, let me now invest, let me now start creating wealth. So that, that's, the, that's the logical progression. That's the logical progression. I mean, you take care of the fundamentals first. Um, you don't go out and buy fancy stuff when you haven't got a, a roof over your head, right? So cover the basics first and, and, and build up with these blocks. Um, and, and, and that's how your portfolio is created. You take off each and, each and every need, and then you have the luxury of being able to invest and, 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 accumulate, and, and accumulate wealth. And it's, it, I mean, it's, 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 very, it's very similar to from a short-term insurance perspective as well. Um, when trying to advise people do not insure things that you can easily replace, right? And it, it, I mean, it's amazing. I get calls all the time, people trying to get me to insure all sorts of weird. But why would I do that? You insure things that are, if if this event occurs in your life, it's going to be catastrophic. This is going to be a, a major setback, okay? Um, but something that you can buy out of uh, out of pocket, you don't insure. Uh, I, I think we're, we're we're out of time, Paul. I mean, it's uh, been a, f- a fascinating conversation, and, and and thanks very much for for for, g- for giving us all these insider tips and the and the and the building blocks. I must say, I, I was hoping to find lots of areas of disagreement with you, but but uh, but, but I think uh, I think we've got a lot of consensus there, uh, and and so uh, you know, I guess this is this is honest money, and that was a that was an honest show from inside the insurance company, looking out as to as to what we can do uh, when we're buying our insurances and why we need it. And, and, and so, Paul Mieser, thanks very much. That was a, a great show. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you for listening to Honest Money. If you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me on Twitter. My handle is at Warren Ingram. Don't forget to subscribe. We're on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Chat soon. Honest Money was proudly brought to you by Outsurance. Outsurance hopes you enjoyed today's discussion about life insurance. Remember, you can SMS LIFE to 30165 for a callback. Not only will a friendly consultant talk to you through your death, disability and critical illness cover needs, you'll also get a quote based on your unique circumstances. Outsurance. You always get something out. Outsurance LIFE is a licensed insurer and FSP. T's and C's apply. 50 cents per SMS.